Earlier this week, I released a video of my 5070 Ti and my uh, journey to overclock it. So I went in and showed you guys how I use the uh, Curve Shaper and MSI Afterburner and uh, apply the memory overclock and everything I kind of do in there. And I did the side-by-side -side comparisons with the factory settings, an undervolt overclock, and just a purely overclock on that card. It's pretty awesome results. You can check out the video uh, in my history, but basically it was about a seven to 10% uplift across the board. And in some extreme cases, about a 15% uplift, which was absolutely awesome to see that type of overclocking potential. And a lot of it comes from the ability on the DDR, GDDR7 of going from that 28 gigabytes, gigabit per second, and able to increase that to get uh, significantly faster memory speeds on it. So after I released that video, quite a few users were like, hey, you know that you can get MSI Afterburner to get it to th plus 3,000, not just plus 2,000. And so I did a little bit of digging and looked into it, and they were right. So the requirement is you need the uh, MSI Afterburner beta build, and then there's an additional file that you can replace. And I'll go through that and show you how to do it. But when you do this, the slider no longer tops out at 2,000, it tops out at 3,000. So if we look in here, I've already done it. And as we can see, you can come all the way down up to plus 3,000. So when you just install the base software, this will top out at two. When you install the additional file, you can go ahead and get that up to three. And like we saw before, we have our updated curve as well. And if you want to see kind of how I did that and the shortcuts and everything I used, you can check out my other video. So immediately I got this done, was super stoked. I was like this new GDDR7, it's going to be the savior. It's going to make these cards so fast. And I immediately loaded up my 3D mark and holy cow, uh, set my new record. So previously with the plus 2000 on the memory, I was like really fighting to break 82. And some madman out here has got 88, 855. I'm sure he's got a lot of tricks uh, up his sleeve, but I could only get to 82, which was, you know, pretty good above average on just a factory gigabyte gaming OC card. It's not exactly the top tier model or anything like that. I was pretty happy with 82. Then I unlocked the plus 3000 and picked up another 100 points which if you take a look at the chart here, I mean, we are up in like the tippy tip tip of the peak of the chart. So we are killing it right now. However, my excitement quickly, you know, came to an end. So, well, before we jump into that, let me show you how I did it. Um, so that way, if you want to play around with it, you can do it too. But if you come over here and you go to the forums at Guru 3D, I'll have links for these in the uh, system. But basically what you want to do is at the very top, it's got the download for the MSI Afterburner Beta 5, or you can just Google it and it'll pull up uh, MSI's official page. That way you make sure you're getting the latest version. And then if you scroll down far enough, um, same kind of post broken up, but it'll say this is a modified database. It's for build five, 16, five, five, five only. And if you go ahead and download this, like I've already done. Oh, that's not it. Well, oh, we'll download it again. I don't know what happened to it. So you get this updated uh, DAT file. So when you come into your PC, I need to clear some things off that hard drive. Uh, you'll go into local disk C program files x86, come in down MSI afterburner, and then in the base afterburner uh, folder, so you don't have to go in any subfolders, you'll see it's right here, MSI afterburner.dat. All you do is drag and drop your file in over there and then start up your MSI afterburner and that's it. You'll get the plus 3000 slider. So like I was saying, as soon as I jumped into the synthetics, I immediately picked up a pretty significant score jump. So I was absolutely stoked about the performance. But 
the second I loaded up any real games, uh, that's kind of where the excitement ended. So I went through the same games and I didn't even bother recording them because there was nothing worth watching. So I went through uh, Counter-Strike 2, Doom the Dark Ages, Cyberpunk, Call of Duty Black Ops 6, and there was no uh, increase in performance whatsoever. In fact, it was within a margin of error. In most cases, I lost about one FPS. So, of course, I started searching, well, what other people, you know, what results have other people gotten? And a lot of people said, like, oh, actually, at 3,000, it didn't work that well for me. When I went to 27, it worked great. I tried that. I tried it in game in the synthetic. Both of them, the scores dropped. So for me, putting it at the 3000 was actually my best case scenario. Then people were kind of theorizing, like maybe uh, it's because you're getting errors. So then air correcting is taking up resources and it's slowing the thing down. And that could possibly be true, especially for the users where at 27, it's better than 3000. But I continually saw increases in the synthetic benchmarks all the way up to the new maximum of 3000 and trying anywhere from 25, 27, 29, 3000. I got the exact same results in game. Zero impact. I mean, absolutely zero impact. So what my theory is, is uh, let's look at the actual information here. So this is just a quick Google search. If you look at this, what is GDDR's standard speed? Well, it's 32 to 48 gigabytes per pen. Now, I know that NVIDIA kind of was early to implement the GDDR7, and they downclocked uh, for the 5070 Ti version. I believe they got it at 28 gigabytes per second. And then if we look at the information for the card, uh, this is on Tech Power Up, just kind of a database for all the GPUs. We see that um, it's got the 28 gigabyte per second. It's a 256 bit bus. So the bandwidth is 898 gigabits per second, gigabytes per second. And you basically get that with the speed via the bus, it gives you your bandwidth. So this is my theory. And if you guys have any other opinions, you can definitely leave it below. I think the people that down clocking or not overclocking it so far, maybe they were unlucky and had a model that was getting a little bit of errors, but I don't. I don't really feel like mine was. My theory is if you look at the 4070 Ti Super, it was GDDR6X, same 256 bus, and the bandwidth was 672. So if you take 896 and 672, at the factory setting, you've already realized a 33% increase in memory bandwidth. And if you look at the actual performance, there's only about a 17% performance difference between those two cards. So your memory bandwidth has already doubled your performance increase. And then when you go ahead and you overclock it by that much more, so, you know, if you're doing plus 3000, your effective rate would be getting closer to what like the factory standard is, the range that it's in. I just think that at a certain point, the memory bandwidth is no longer your limiting factor. So by increasing it more and more and more and more and more, you're just there's going to be diminishing returns on what type of performance you're going to see. At the heart of it, the core and the shader units and everything that's doing the work, it's got to be able to do the work. Yeah, being able to transfer the information faster and more information is great, but if it can't process it, if the uh, the cores aren't able to handle it, um, then that's kind of the, the end of the road. You can indefinitely, you know, hypothetically, you could indefinitely increase the bandwidth. And at a certain point, you're just not going to see any additional performance returns, which I think is what the situation is here, because we've had a massive bandwidth increase and we have not had that massive of a performance intake out of the core. So, I mean, the good news is, is the next generation if the cores do speed up if they're still using the same memory you know maybe the additional overclocking will help but uh at this point in time i just don't really think it will but you've got all the information you can play around with it maybe you'll see on your system you know every card's a little different maybe it'll help you out a bit 
But uh, that kind of brings us to the question, well, like, well, why did I see the uptick in the synthetic? Synthetic benchmarks are designed to basically be the perfect test scenario under the perfect conditions for what you're trying to test. So like when you look at the numbers, they are just rock solid. So, I mean, I got a little bit over time decrease, but I mean, we're looking at my core clock was 3202. And as we come all the way down to the end of the test, it dropped to 3180. So about a 20 megahertz variance over the entire test. And the clock frequency on the memory is absolutely rock solid. CPUs rock solid. You're never going to see lines like this in an actual video game, especially out of the CPU. Like that should be going up and down. So these things are designed to absolutely maximize every bit of the hardware in order to pick up those tiny deviations between systems, because, you know, that's how you build out your leaderboard. So my theory here is, is under the perfect conditions you know, maybe that extra bandwidth can give us a little bit of that extra edge that we need. But realistically, in day to day gaming, I'm just not seeing the results. So bottom line, I do appreciate the tip uh, from my viewers. It was fun to try out. It was really cool. And I was super excited when uh, the first test I did had a major uptick in performance. But I think uh, on the day to day, the plus 2000 did help out the plus and in, in real gaming applications plus 3000. I just wasn't realizing any any further gains. But if you want, you can try it out. You got all the links and uh, let me know if your results differ at all. And uh, good luck gaming out there and building your PC. Drop a like and subscribe. See you later.